talks on Freemasonry. And actually, when I've spoken in the past, including here, uh, I've actually talked about uh, subjects that, that I've been writing about. And I think this is the first time I've actually, um, in a way, talked more about, I'm not going to talk exactly about my art, I'm going to talk about Masonic symbolism and what it means to me. Um, but, but hopefully that will give you some kind of uh, some kind of different perspective on the symbols, maybe a little bit historical, but mostly my own personal understanding of them. So, um, so I, I don't know um, how many people here are familiar with the concept of tracing boards. Uh, I, I suspect many look at you are. Not. So uh, mostly in England, maybe in a few lodges here, uh, and certainly in Europe. Uh, Freemasonry, which um, initiates men through different degrees or rituals. At the end of the ritual, there's a lecture, as most of you know. And in uh, in England and Europe in particular, uh, different tracing boards are shown depending on which which degree uh, the candidate is going through. So the, the first one is the entered apprentice. The middle one is the feather craft degree, and the third one is the master mason degree. So if you look on the screen, you'll see. Um, Although there's a difference in style, and some of the symbols are a little, little bit different depending on uh, which jurisdiction, it's, it's uh, it, they're pretty quite similar. So here we have the lead, uh, black and white tile floor. Uh, this is a, an English uh, 19th century tracing board, and again you see pretty much the same symbols. Uh, the one on the left is a, again it's an English tracing board. Uh, you see a coffin and skull and crossbones. Some of, some of the symbols are a little different. Most, most of them are pretty similar. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the history of the tracing board, but uh, at least representing Masonic, Masonic symbols during the rituals played some kind of role early on. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So here, here's an initiation. Uh, this, this is an etching, uh, French etching. And um, instead of a tracing board, they actually have a floor cloth. And, but again, you can see the same. Uh, symbols is on the Masonic third degree, so there's a coffin of skull and crossbow, uh, which is essentially the same as the, the board on the left, and similar to the one on uh, the board on the right here. Um, but it, although originally I was a little bit haphazard, and Freemasons would take their own tracing boards, uh, a lot of the symbols were sort of mixed up, it was, um, they were not codified at all, but later on they became, uh, especially in Britain, they became much more codified. But um, uh, I want to talk about uh, more, more about the symbolism than the history. So um, I'm not going to say exactly what the Masonic ritual says. I think some people might be a little un unhappy if I did that. So I'm going to talk about <laughs> my my uh, my understanding. And I think even when we look at some of the boards, we can get a, again an appreciation for what what's going on on a basic level, even if we don't actually know anything about Freemasonry. So I mean, obviously here we have the, a ladder leading up into the blue sky. On the floor, we have a black and white tile floor. Uh, there's some a builder's tools, a hammer and a chisel. Uh, there's a rock, and then a, a block that seems to have been carved from it. And um, if we were going to ask ourselves, uh, what is the meaning of this? I think we might might come to the conclusion that. It broadly represents what we might call a higher consciousness, because of the you know we're leaving the earth and we're going up into this uh, blue sky where there's a sun and a moon and this uh, uh, sort of symbol of deity or God or uh, some kind of higher being. Uh, higher consciousness is one of those terms that we hear quite often, uh, especially. Uh, with spiritual people who often talk about higher consciousness. And if, uh, personally what I've observed is that they don't always really define what they think higher consciousness is, but very often it's connected to some kind of uh, transcendental experience, such as a Kundalini meditation perhaps, or with um, some kind of uh, drug taking or something like that. But I want to ask uh, what, what higher consciousness might mean uh, in relation to Freemasonry, and I'm going to do that by looking at the, uh, uh, the symbols of Freemasonry, as I say. Um, before I talk about going up into higher consciousness, I want to talk about coming down from higher consciousness, or from this uh, being uh, up here. 
um, Freemasons bring a lot of things to the lodge, a lot of Freemasons, especially today, uh, when they join, uh, are more, have an interest in things like esotericism, uh, occultism sometimes, the Kabbalah, alchemy, uh, Buddhism, and uh, very often they can see their interest reflected in Freemasonry. And it's, it's certainly one of the stranger things, I think, that when you look at Freemasonry, if you have some other interest besides it, such as alchemy, such as Islam, or such as Buddhism, it's, a, it's a, one of those strange things that you can actually see quite a lot of connections between them, uh, which has led to a lot of um, interesting theories and a lot of bad scholarship. But um, for those Freemasons who are interested in the Kabbalah, which for those who don't know was originally a Jewish sort of mystical or esoteric system, system it was later absorbed into sort of Christian theology and Christian esotericism, and then more recently into, uh, into uh, occultism. Um, but for those who are interested in Kabbalah, they often look at the, the first degree tracing board and see the Kabbalah in there. Whether it's historically there, I think that's up for debate. But um, if we look, we see three pillars, which are uh, pretty the major part of the tracing board, and the more Kabbalistically inclined Freemasons uh, would relate those three pillars to the three pillars of the uh, Kabbalistic tree of life. Uh, so if you look, there's a, actually a central pillar and then two either side. And um, uh, Kabbalah is not, not really a, a major subject of interest to me, so I, I don't claim to be an expert in it, but uh, uh, it should be said that that's not the only uh, representation of, of Kabbalah. Uh, there are other ways of representing it quite historically, such as emanations from uh, from the source, with the uh, of the spheres actually going outwards rather than down. And um, Kabbalah tends to be uh, more popular in Western esotericism and in, with Freemasons. It was it's definitely true that it was absorbed into some of the higher degrees to very, very uh, to varying degrees. Um, if, uh, whether it was in the three craft degrees is open to debate. But um, so with, for example, Islam, you have another uh, system of emanations where you begin with Allah, then the first consciousness, and then uh, various um, various intelligences which rule the planets, angels, and so on, and right down to uh, the material world. Well. Um, if you look at the ancient Greek tradition, you have somebody like Iambrutus, who's an ancient Greek poet and uh, mathematician who talks about uh, the theology of numbers. So the first number represents the absolute, and then all of the other, uh, other numbers from one to 10 uh, represent different qualities, so five would be uh, the five um, senses and this sort of thing. Uh, what's interesting about the Amblichus is that he describes the first manifestation, the monad or one, as being, uh, he calls it the craftsman. Uh, if we look at Plato, Plato described uh, creation being made out of different elements. And it, each element was uh, supposed to have a geometric solid. So uh, uh, fire is the, the pyramid, uh, earth is the cube, and so on. And you get material existence uh, and differences within material existence, because each thing has a different number and different combination of, uh, of these geometric solids. And again, uh, Plato talks about uh, essentially the creator being kind of artificer or craftsman. And um, in Freemasonry, of course, something very similar. Uh, Freemasonry talks about the, uh, the god or the creator as being a, a great architect, or sometimes a, a grand geometrician. So there's a long history of, um, of the idea of deity or god creating through geometry, especially with ancient Greek. Uh, and with Freemasonry as well. Um, there's quite a big dis distance in time between the two. However, if we look to the uh, 16th and early 17th century, uh, we find a figure called Johannes Kepler, astronomer and mathematician. And um, uh, he, he wrote a, a, a pretty interesting book called The Six Cornered Snowflake, uh, which he published in uh, 1611. And um, if you look at the second board that, that I painted, um, you'll notice that I've emphasized lilies and pomegranates. And probably one of the reasons why I did emphasize that was because uh, 
I spent some time reading the Six Cornered Snowflake. And um, <clears throat> as the title suggests, uh, Kepler was interested in the geometry of the snowflake, which uh, he knew was uh, had a, a six points. But he was also he also in, uh, sort of uh, introduced this idea of geometry and creation, uh, in a way based on this Platonic idea. Uh, and he gave several examples of how geometry turns up in the world. And uh, one of them, he talks about the pomegranate. Uh, he talks about the lily and the, the beehive. So the, the lily has a geometry of a hexagon, uh, as does the, uh, the honeycomb, so the beehive. And uh, the pomegranate, he said that essentially if you pack the uh, pomegranate seeds together in the pomegranate, you get something that looks a little bit like a uh, platonic solid, essentially. So he sees ge geometry everywhere in creation. Um, so that's going down from uh, from Godhead, as you might call it, or the great architect. So I want to look at uh, going up. So, so in that case, how does Freemasonry think about going up? Well, if it is true that, that uh, the natural world embodies <coughs> some kind of um, some kind of geometry, uh, <coughs> embodies in a certain sense the mind of God. And this is not a new idea, it's the idea of natural law, that the physical world represents the mind of God. Uh, and if you look closely at it, you can figure out, um, you can kind of see into the mind of God as it were. So even with uh, ancient cultures, uh, they obviously knew about the seasons, the rising and setting of the sun, and could predict the planets and where they were going to be. And that's obviously because uh, there seems to be certain laws that are underlying existence. So obviously even today, there's 24 hours in a day, it doesn't really change. We know where the planets will be. So you can kind of peer into the mind of the Creator, and everything seems to be running according to some kind of divine law. Freemasonry <coughs> says this perhaps in a slightly different way. I think what, what's, um, what's most interesting about, uh, for example, the beehive in uh, Freemasonry is that, in, from the rituals I've read anyway, it doesn't actually mention uh, the hexagonal cells. And if we were going to sum up what the beehive, uh, the beehive means in Freemasonry, we could look at it different ways. But I think one of the things uh, we can conclude, conclude is that, in a way, it's a kind of metaphor for the Masonic law, that the, 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 the bees are working together for some higher aim and cooperating and, um, and being industrious. And this is the same with the Masonic Lodge. The brothers are supposed to be working together for something higher. But I suppose we could extend the metaphor and say that the Queen Bee could be in some way a representation of uh, the great architect that the Freemasons are supposed to be in some way or other uh, serving. And um, I think, in, in a way, Kepler also gives some kind of insight into that Masonic idea. And he, he says that uh, the the actual cells of, a, of the beehive are hexagonal because if you have six walls to each cell rather than say four, then you have six neighbors that are going to cooperate to build that cell for you. So each of the bees are cooperating uh, together very strongly. And this seems to be quite a Masonic idea really. Uh, but it's a, I think it's a curious fact that from what I've seen anyway, uh, the, the notion of geometry in relation to the beehive isn't mentioned. But Freemasonry was an oral tradition for a long time, and uh, things went by the wayside. But I think it would be um, very strange if Freemasons uh, that included it in the ritual didn't know uh, that, uh, that it, it had some kind of hexagonal geometry attached to it. Um, so, that, so that's one way in which we can see sort of natural law as an example in the natural world that Freemasons should be emulating. And then I think the other most obvious one, uh, we see different elements of nature, on the grand cities, obviously, uh, but the, the sun and moon uh, as well on the, on the first degree tracing board. And um, I'm not going to say exactly what is said in, in the Sonic ritual, but to sum it up in a nutshell, uh, the worshipful master is, which is, for those who don't know, the worshipful master of a lodge, you could compare it to the master of a martial arts class. So he's the one taking the class, and the lodge would be the class itself. 
So the big worshipful master of a lodge is, is said to be said to preside over the lodge in the same way that the sun and moon uh, preside over uh, the day and night. And I think if we think about that, we can sort of uh, deduce um, what, what's being said. So what, what is being said? Uh, first of all, the sun and moon rise regularly. So one assumes that the, the master of the lodge should be there regularly to, um, to lead the proceedings. And uh, the other thing, and perhaps the more important thing, is that uh, the sun and moon uh, both shed light. Uh, we get daylight, obviously, from the sun, and the moon reflects the light of the sun, uh, and that's how you get moonlight. So presumably, the worshipful master is also supposed to shed light. Um, uh, obviously, that would be not a literal light, but a symbolic light or a spiritual light. Uh, shedding light is um, a pretty standard uh, term, meaning, I think as we all know, uh, to give knowledge to someone. Um, how many masters of lodges do that? I don't know. But that would seem to be what's implied. So Freemasonry often describes itself as being illustrated by symbols, and um, which is essentially what we're looking at now. And it's sort of just by the by, but uh, if you look at the original word, the original meaning of the word illustration, it actually means like, illumination. So you hear, you hear about the illuminated manuscript, right? An illuminated manuscript is an illustrated manuscript. But it's kind of an interesting word in a way. Um, I think it's more interesting than it sounds, because um, Freemasonry, if it is illustrated by, by symbols, you could say it's illuminated by symbols, and one of the, one of the aspects, or one of the the big symbols of Freemasonry is the search for light, obviously the sun and moon, and the eye appears to have light. So in a way, the light of Freemasonry is coming through the symbols, but that's just an aside. So the, so the first way in which Freemasonry uh, seems to suggest that you can reach this higher consciousness is by looking at nature, uh, finding what is applicable to you as an example, and then, a, and then applying it to you. Uh, to shed light, to do things with regularity, which you could you could translate to habits. But I think we know how habits um, can change consciousness over time. Uh, to work like bees and so on. Um, so that's the first way. And then the, sec the second thing I think is um, is a reflection on death. Uh, if we look at the the Master Mason tracing board. Uh, I painted a skull, but uh, as you saw, uh, very often uh, there's a skull and crossbones. Uh, a lot of English tracing boards have a, a coffin. Some of them actually have a, uh, show a coffin with a with a lid open and a corpse inside. Which um, I think, for the modern world, is kind of macabre, and I think a lot of people might be a bit maybe not scared of that, but would be a little bit queasy at the idea of reflecting on death and reflecting on a skull and crossbones. Or reflecting on a corpse, and it seems a, it seems bizarre. And um, I don't think it's that we're afraid of death, but we've in the modern world we've transformed death into something, something else. And uh, it's very rare to see a corpse in the modern world. Uh, in fact, I think most people go for decades without without seeing one. But at the same time, if you turn on the TV in the evening, uh, chances are, as soon as you turn it on, the story if it's a drama is going to be about some killing or mass killing. So in a way, we've turned death into an entertainment. So we can watch it all day as a, as a, as a, as a drama or something like that, or a movie, but uh, we don't like taking it seriously. And we're a bit, a bit, a bit queasy about that. Uh, there's a, in Vajrayana Buddhism, there's a meditation where you meditate on your breathing, you meditate on your body, parts of your body, then you meditate on the elements that are in your body, and then you meditate on your body being killed, and sometimes you even meditate on it being uh, devoured by wild animals and this kind of thing, um, which is a real meditation that's been done for a long time. And if you skip forward uh, to the late samurai um, manual, the Hagakura, uh, there too you find uh, the samurais are advised to uh, meditate on their death every day in the most gruesome ways as well. So they were supposed to meditate on the being killed by spears or dying of disease and this sort of thing. <coughs> and uh, likewise in Europe, around the time of the, the Black Death, uh, there was actually a, a book about how to die well. And it was a, you know, 
uh, everybody was reading it. But I think the idea that people would buy a book on how to die well today, I don't know how, how well it would sell. But, um, but you know, obviously uh, there was a Christian society and a lot of how to die well was meditating on Jesus and this kind of thing. But it was a big part of the culture. And obviously if you walk into a church today, uh, if you look at, look at the, you know, the wall in front of you, you, you are unlikely to see baby Jesus. You see uh, Jesus on the cross, which is a, a much more macabre image. So death has always been something to take seriously and meditate on, but not in the modern world, with rare exceptions. And I think one interesting exception, and I'm not holding up him up as some kind of a guru or anything like that, but uh, it's interesting to me that Steve Jobs, who did, did uh, not really practice Zen Buddhism to some degree, um, he actually said that uh, uh, reflecting on death was the most important thing you could do to make a decision. And he said in his case, when he was pretty young, not much more than a kid, he came across one of those sort of um, uh, fortune cookie type uh, sayings, which are you know, uh, pretty throwaway, that said, uh, if, you think, if you think every day is your last one day, you'll be right. And he said that he decided from then on that he was going to wake up every morning and ask himself, uh, if this were my last day on earth, is this what I would want to be doing? And if it wasn't for enough days, he would change it. But he actually said that if you, if you were, if to reflect on death is uh, the most important thing you can do to make a decision. And I, I tend to agree with that as well. And I think one of, that's one of the things that uh, Freemasonry, uh, even if we know nothing about Freemasonry, just the images of death, which make, uh, make some people a little, a, little, a little nervous maybe, but that, that's what's going on. And um, in, um, in some jurisdictions, especially in Europe, and there's one or two lodges here that, uh, um, but it's, it's not that common in America, but there's something called the Chamber of Reflection. So prior to being initiated, if you, were, if you, were, if, if you join a lodge that has a Chamber of Reflection, then um, very often uh, there will there'll suddenly be some kind of skull and crossbones or some kind of representation of a skull and crossbones, uh, some other symbols such as the scythe, which is there, and uh, you're supposed to reflect on death. In some cases, uh, in, in some European jurisdictions, I know that they actually make you write out your will. And uh, it may sound a little, a little strange, but it's to make you focus on uh, what's important to you in life. Uh, most of the things that, that attract us, we're not going to be thinking about when the final moment comes. And if you think about what will be important to you at the end. You might want to focus on that in life. So the first thing I'm saying to, uh, in regard to cultivating this higher consciousness is the, uh, looking at nature and uh, finding what laws of nature apply to us. And the second one is to reflect on uh, death. Uh, I'm going to uh, wrap up by just returning to this, uh, this board and just talking about a couple of symbols here. And I'm going to talk just a tiny bit about this rectangular shape down here, which is the 24-inch gauge. And it's been written about in uh, books that are available to the public. And I did a quick search online, and the information is uh, uh, pretty much out there. So I don't think I'm giving anything secret away. But this is this, what looks like a ruler. It kind of is a ruler. It's called the 24-inch gauge. Uh, so obviously, it's divided into 24 or 24 inches. And uh, Masonically, they're divided into three eights, which, uh, which refers to eight hours of the day. So eight hours is supposed to be for uh, work, eight hours for rest, and eight hours for God. And um, I think you would certainly be uh, hard pushed to devote eight hours a day to God unless you were a monk. I mean, it's certainly in this day and age, but probably in any day and age. But I think that from that, you can get the idea that you know, that, um, uh, I don't really like the word balance, I think it's what we use, but so you, life has to have proportion, right? So it shouldn't all be work, it shouldn't all be necessarily devoted in, the, in a sort of monastic sense to God. But uh, that if, you're, if you learn from nature in particular, um, you're gonna have a, a life that's um, structured um, in a certain way to bring out the best in you. And in regard to you know, natural law, I've been talking about uh, looking at nature and finding how it applies to us. And a more modern example might be something like uh, uh, food. Uh, people that 
uh, tend to earn a little more, prefer, generally speaking, to uh, buy organic food, or what we used to call food. And uh, why is that? That's because nature seems to provide more nutrition to us than all these other uh, concoctions. And um, so during the day, um, the Freemasonry seems to be suggesting that we divide up our day to uh, maybe not necessarily to God, but spirituality, work, and other things as well. Though we should have some kind of balanced or, or proportioned life. And um, I didn't depict it, but if we go back, So the first degree. So here it's actually um, portrayed. There are actually three little figures it's a bit on the ladder. It's a little bit difficult to see what they are, but they represent uh, faith, hope, and charity. And I actually painted it on one of my old reports. And um, so, according to Catholicism, there were three saints that were martyred with, by those names. And uh, some, um, uh, by some accounts, they, their mother was wisdom. But um, I think faith, uh, hope, and charity are a little bit awkward as words go for us today. Um, they're, not, they're not especially appealing. Uh, they're a little bit old fashioned and a little bit conservative. But, uh, so what is faith? Well, faith that seems to be uh, belief that there is something above us, God or a creator or some kind of supernatural force or some kind of universal mind, uh, whether it's some kind of uh, internal energy or something, but the belief that there's something beyond us some, something that created us, or something that sort of flows through us and gives, gives us life and gives us meaning. And I think uh, with that, it's also implied that we have a connection to this, this higher being. Because if we didn't have a, a connection to it, what would be the point in you know, having any interest in it at all? And obviously there are different ways that people have thought about having a connection. Some people think it will be judged at the end of our lives, in the afterlife. Other people might think it's a kind of universal internal energy that's just flowing through us and taking us to maybe some another incarnation or something like that. But faith seems to be belief in something higher and the belief that we ourselves are connected to uh, hope. I think we all know what hope is the belief that we can make things better. I think in a Masonic sense it, it would primarily refer to ourselves that we can change ourselves for the better. Uh, particularly in regard to uh, our thinking and our habits and our daily life. And then lastly is charity, which I think it may be the trickiest word of all, because I think we all know that feeling when somebody comes on the uh, subway and asks for money, we think, oh no, I better give a dollar or I'm going to feel guilty all night. And there's a slightly guilty feeling about charity. We feel it's something we should do. We should give our money away because otherwise we'll feel bad. But um, I, I think a, a better word for us today might be uh, generosity. And um, for a couple of reasons. And one is that we can be generous with our money, or we can be generous with our time, or we can be generous with our knowledge, and probably a, a lot of other things as well. And I think that uh, our time and our knowledge are just as valuable, and in fact may even be more valuable for a lot of people today. And um, this may seem, seem a strange thing to say, but uh, I think generosity in a way is connected to fear or getting over fear, right? Because if you don't want to give that homeless guy a dollar, it might be because you fear that you, know, you need all your money to pay the rent, which might be a legitimate fear. And but there are other fears as well. People will maybe be afraid to give their time because they might be missing something good on TV that actually they could do without watching. And um, you know, as an author, I, I can say that uh, you know I, I'm sure we've all read books by particular authors, and you read one book and you think that was great, and then you read the next two or three books and think it was exactly the same as the first one, but a couple of details changed. And I think that what happens is that people get a little bit nervous and they feel like that they can't really share all the knowledge they have because then they'll run out. And I can say that from from myself, um, you know, I've never felt like that. I always felt like I should give everything I have knowledge-wise, and then maybe if I do that, I'll find something, something else. And it seems, uh, in a way, it's paradoxical, but I think the more you actually end up, the more you give, the more you, <coughs> you are to find something new. 
and uh, it's only in terms of um, it's only in terms of knowledge. The more knowledge you give, the, the more you find. So um, to to sum up, the three the three different ways of, that uh, Freemasonry would seem to tell us to develop a higher consciousness. The one is again look at nature and see what laws are applicable to you. Uh, the next one, meditate on death, meditate on your own mortality. Be conscious that you're not going to live forever, and what things might be important to you at the last moment. And, uh, and lastly, uh, have a balanced life. And uh, I think in particular, uh, try and be generous, if not with your money, then with your, with your time and with your knowledge. And that way, you yourselves will most definitely grow. Thanks very much. <laughs>